All right, it's Monday. That means it's time for Jay Lehman on the Illini Enquirer podcast. I'm Jeremy Warner. Welcome in. And Jay, we have another huge victory for Illinois to uh, talk about. Three top 25 wins. Now Nebraska, Michigan, and Kansas are no longer in that top 25. But still, this one felt big. The culmination of it all, the 100-year anniversary. Josh Whitman's been fighting to get this game for a long time, and I was able to catch up with him afterwards. And he he was feeling like this was a big moment. Sold out crowd. And the way you won was just as impressive, Jay. But uh, just go ahead. Uh, what, your initial thoughts, big picture about this win. Illinois went to the World Series of Poker college football table and put all their chips in on this weekend they, for years, despite all the, the schedule changes with, you know, 16 teams, now 18 teams, divisions dissolving. They were they said, we want Michigan on this date which is the closest date to almost 100 years to the, the, the Red Grange dedication game in 1924 with Michigan. Remember now, Michigan is the most successful program from 2021 to 2023 in really in all of college football. Some people could argue Georgia in that regard, but 2023, they ran the table and uh, you know beat Alabama in the playoff and won everything. So you had the defending national champion and, and Illinois said, we won it. We saw like we're asking to play uh, Purdue, thank goodness, or Indiana, right? Uh, thank goodness too. But no, in this regard, it's kind of funny. But it's not like we we just wanted some run of the mill Big Ten team. Uh, we wanted Michigan for a lot of different reasons. Had a ton of alumni back. I was able to be at the hundred year uh, celebration, uh, the gala the night before on Friday with generations uh, players from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and 2010s, and even present players. And you just got to feel like. I felt like I was just a speck in the great history of that stadium and what that stadium has stood for. And for Illinois, with all that stuff going on, with the uniforms and the helmets and Brad Nessler, CBS, the first time CBS has done a game at Memorial Stadium since 1983 Michigan game, which is crazy. Now, CBS had the SEC package for years. And to have them come – and do what they did from a uh, production standpoint, which is a ton of work. You know, on a typical Big Ten network game, you have seven to eight cameras. They had 40 cameras. They had a whole production early on, which was like a mini movie to start. So, and then for Illinois to come out and play the way they did in true Brett Bielma fashion, and what we've been hoping to see, where winning, you win in the trenches on the offensive line and on the defensive line, you create turnovers and play smart football. It was a day to remember, 72 and sunny. They'll be talking about this one for a long time. And by the way, Illinois is in the hunt for the Big Ten Championship, the playoff, and bowl eligible. Let's go! And they got a game against number one Oregon coming up this week. There we go. Get into, and I want to get into the nitty-gritty of this game, and it was nitty-gritty, which was a great thing for Illinois uh, to see. But I want to ask you, Jay, like – this was a moment for fans that were in attendance, for fans that were watching. This could be a moment for recruiting. This certainly helps you, uh, and it sets up a bigger moment for next week. But I want to ask you as a former player, right? you were with a lot of former players. There were a lot of big names that were back in the stadium sure. Sure. this weekend. Um, so what does that mean for, for you football alumni, you, you former greats, uh, that your program is 6-1, and one, that you beat Michigan at home, that you went on the road and beat Nebraska, that you beat Kansas here at home when they were ranked? Like, What's that all mean for you guys? Well, I think it's huge. One, one, we're just all thrilled. A lot of us were there Friday and in the stands and in the box together and just excited that we're just competitive. And we all hate Michigan together. So it was hilarious. It was fun to talk about Michigan and whatnot. And, and, and you know, there's there's these generations of players. There's these 80s guys that beat Michigan. And the 90s guys had really good success against Michigan. And, you know, our team never beat Michigan. So it was kind of it was kind of fun to kind of share stories. But we're just so proud of um the guys that are playing now I would say this you you always know that you kind of stand on the shoulders of those that go before you but it was really emphasized this week when you heard about the history of how this university came to build this stadium and why it looks the way it does and and how many people have played here and that this as much as the world has changed in 100 years it was still Illinois and Michigan out there on a Saturday afternoon playing football with 60 plus thousand people in the stands. And so it's just, it was kind of a a full circle moment for me. I was like, man, I'm I'm really a small, small part of something so, so big. And it was a memory game. It was a game that you're there with friends, you're with family. For me, I'm there with other teammates and other alumni. And it's like, you remember where you're at. You remember what happened. 
And that's what sports is all about. It's creating lasting memories with people that you love uh, around something that you have a common interest in. Well, Jay, you mentioned it. They, they won the wish Michigan way, right? They, they won in the trenches in this game, which I think would have surprised most of us coming into sure. the game, given what Michigan had in the trenches and given where Illinois has struggled there for, for most of the season. So let's start with the offensive line because, I mean, I, I did not expect Illinois to outrush Michigan right. in this one. They have 187 yards. I know a fake punt went to that. and I, I know the quarterback went to that. I want to ask you about that. But what stood out about Illinois uh, offensive line and the way they were able to kind of win? against a, a very talented defensive front in Michigan. I thought Mason Graham had his moments because he's really, yeah. really good. But Illinois more than held its own. Absolutely. I, I would say this. But coming in the game at 5-1, and one, the only reason we were 5-1, and one, it wasn't because of our offensive line play or defensive line play was really, really rare in college football. It was because we had a quarterback and, and two or three receivers that were making some unbelievable plays, and Barry Lunny was dialing up some plays to keep us in games and win – when we needed to win and get a play, whether it be an overtime or in the fourth quarter. That wasn't the case necessarily in this game. I think they made some real adjustments. What was so interesting to me just schematically is on that offensive line, we ran the ball in the interior way better than we had run the whole year. Now, some of there was an adjustment by Wink Martindale. Wink Martindale, the defensive coordinator for Michigan, it looked to me a lot of times that we saw Graham and Grant, their two tackles for Michigan, uh, Outside in three techniques, they, there was not a lot of nose tackle action there. And then because they were in three techniques, the defensive ends were very wide against our tackles, right? It was almost like they look at the scout report and say, listen, 80% of their runs are on the edge. Let's take away the edge. That And, and by taking away the edge, we're also going to take away the bubble screen and, and flat passes that they like to hit Pat Bryan on, that they like to hit tight ends on. And they did a good job of that. But what you give up, we saw right away what Barry Lunny exploited was the draw right up the middle with Aiden Lawfrey for, you know, 25, 30-yard run. And they were able to get three, four, five yards a clip on first down. Even runs, there was no real room. They were able to get that push with Kruitz and Geske and Chrysler and Henderson, whoever was in there, to really get that wedge going and make it second and six and set up the play action. So it was an adjustment by Michigan Barry Lunny and Illinois were ready for it. And because of that, we're able to chew up enough clock and set up manageable downs. Yeah, those draw plays are going to be early on my film review with you. And yeah, and I, I saw that one kind of going wide, but it's good to see Aiden Lawfrey uh, get that kind of burst. We haven't seen that here in a little bit. But one I one about Aiden Lawfrey, you know, it, Coach B mentioned he finally felt 100% healthy, kind of threw that out there. We know that he missed a little bit of time early. Again, never fully on the injury report. But a guy we're saying, hey, when is he going to come out? Could have been a little bit injured in September. So I wanted to throw that in there because I think it's important for fans to realize that just because a guy's not on the injury report doesn't mean the guy's not battling to get to 100%. And when you're a speed back like Aiden Lawfrey, being a top speed guy or a track guy, you have any kind of hamstring thing or any kind of soft tissue, it can slow you down a lot. Jay, I want to ask you, though, Luke Altmeyer is a big part of this running attack, right? Like the last two games – He's run for 149 yards, uh, 15 times on 15 carries and two touchdowns. When he doesn't get sacked, you take out those sacks. Sure. What does he mean? What is the impact of Luke Altmaier with his rushing attack, with his legs, and just the offense in general? Well, I, I think first and foremost, you you have to you have to account for the quarterback as a defense, right? So it takes a it takes a guy off of your running back where it's like, okay, we got to be ready, even if he doesn't. You know, they don't know if he's going to hand the ball off on zone read or not. And uh, one thing that Luke's really underrated on is ball handling. I think he's a tremendous ball handler as far as the way he carries out fakes. He hasn't fumbled when he runs the ball. He's fumbled when he's been sacked. But when he runs the ball, has pretty good ball security uh, past the line of scrimmage. And he's got a really, really good inst instinct of, hey, when do I go outside and when do I go inside? What I love, though is they were actually making uh, – Luke uh, Luke Altmaier was actually reading a lot of his zone read off of Mason Graham, a lot yeah. of off Kenneth Grant. They were leaving those guys unblocked and then having the tackle turn out and block the defensive end. And th that means that now you're making defenders think that they're not necessarily used to think. So you've switched up who they were reading on. And then you saw Luke, instead of going outside that tackle, would go inside the tackle, really hitting in this vacated B-gap. So there's a lot of different twists 
on that zone read. Sometimes the tackle is going to block down. Sometimes it's going to block out. They've done a great job of mixing that up. And Luke has done a phenomenal job, not just in the zone read game, on the quarterback sneak game, and also the boot game, sprint out game, and of course, scrambling when stuff breaks down. Yeah. Only 80 yards, nine of 18 throwing, did draw a lot of pass interferences. So if you throw yeah. that yard. Tony you- himself had two huge pass interferences, one down the sideline and one with that. Um, and, it, you know, that doesn't necessarily count uh, as yardage, but it did make a difference in the game. Yeah, so like he didn't have this explosive day through the air, and I felt like Luke missed a couple of throws. Couldn't tell if some of them he wasn't were- as accurate as he usually yeah. is. Uh, and he would he would tell you the same thing. Even when Zakari had that big third down pickup, that was a low pass. He was wide open. Mm-hmm. It wasn't re- you know we were talking about we haven't really seen Luke miss on the deep ball that much. I felt like he missed once or twice. Didn't give Zakari necessarily a chance. But I hand, you know hands uh, hats off to Michigan. They were able to get their hands on probably five or six balls at critical times. Yeah. And some of those receivers were open, uh, so they did a good job getting their hands up. But the thing is, I just thought he played controlled, right, Jay? Like, uh, you know, I, I know he didn't throw up for a bunch of yards, but the plays he made, the way he was able to extend plays and, and get a couple big throws, like that was just a poise control game. And you just saw the difference in quarterback play between these two teams, even if Luke didn't put up monster numbers. No, you, you have 100% confidence that Luke is in control. But they're only a couple of plays away, you know, a blocked field goal and maybe, you know, being able to convert one of those field goals into a touchdown to putting up 28 points, you know, mm-hmm. 20, you know 27, 30 points and uh, against a very good team. Now, I think they got a little conservative in the fourth. They kind of realized Michigan's going to real hard time scoring twice. Um, and so they got a little bit more conservative, but you always felt Luke was in control. Um, you, you felt like Barry Lunny had enough of the answers, especially in the first half, to make it happen. And I love how they capitalized. Uh, I really, uh, after the fake punt, I love how they capitalized in the red zone with, with a great kind of old school trap run play to, to to Josh McCray, which from the six, you know, he was the up back. And so just just a couple, you know, different different wrinkles in there gave us enough to kind of put that game out of reach. Remember, this is still a very, very good defense for Michigan with a very high priced coordinator who came over from the Giants and was with the Ravens for a long time. So that Illinois definitely held their own, especially in the trenches. And that's going to be a huge confidence builder, right? Because you can win a game without your quarterback and you, and, and, and Pat Brands and Carver just making plays. And if they do, fantastic. But it almost makes you think, could you go to Oregon? Or if, if they played like that in the trenches against Penn State, would have they had a chance down the stretch? I think that's really what you got to think about because – uh, they were able to win in those areas, and that made the difference. Can I can I ask you anybody that's standing out in the offensive line? Like I think Josh Kruitz is playing really good ball the last couple of weeks, and and Brandon Henderson flashes. Um, yeah. I don't know if it's consistent yet, but he, he flashes some power and some strength. And well, Henderson is it, probably the biggest mauler that we have. Um, so I, I like that. I thought Kruitz finally getting to this second level with authority, and that's what I like to see out of him. He's really crafty and whatnot. Um, I still think that Gesky plays a little high sometimes. And I, and, and I think he's got everything that you need in a guard. I think he's a little high. I've been so impressed by J.C. Davis. You know, I was talking to a scout on the sideline before the game. And, you know, I said, you know who I'm really impressed with? And, uh, you know, uh, I said, I'm because these scouts won't ever, ever tell you sometimes who they're looking at. Like, oh, we're looking at a lot of people. And like I'm going to go tell people like I'm doing right now. But anyway, I said uh, – uh, yeah, I'm really impressed with 74. He goes, he's on my list. And uh, because his balance, you know, and, and his ability and, and whatnot has been really, really solid. So I, I thought the tackles, again, have played pretty solid as well as they always have. But again, I think, uh, you know, a guy that on the lead draw we saw him block, on the edge we see him block is is Tanner Arkin. Mm-hmm. And, and, and we've seen his passing, uh, his pass catching ability continue to improve. That was a very contested catch against – uh, the defensive back for that touchdown. And you obviously saw him on the fake punt, but he's a big critical piece to this offense. And so I think he could be the next tip, Ryman. What, uh, speaking of Tanner Arkin, fake punt, what do, what do you want to talk about with it? Because it was a game changer and ballsy call, obviously. Yeah, re- really ballsy call. We saw that we saw that Brett was not afraid to go for it early on. They went for it on, you know, fourth and one about the 20. Um, but what I like about that is it was, just before midfield, which means that the 
the likelihood of them being in punt safe, keeping their defense on the field is, is way less likely. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then what's interesting is they kind of baited him. You know, Michigan had gotten semi close to a punt earlier. Yep. And so it felt like they were bringing pressure. It looked like they were bringing pressure to try to block a punt and man, they had them schemed up with the pin pole kind of scheme. And uh, there was just nobody there. I will say that, you know, the guy directly to the left of Lane Hansen, number 97 for Michigan, nobody blocked him. He could have made the tackle. It just happened so fast. You, it's really hard for a defender when you're like, I'm rushing to block this punt and it, it changes. It's very difficult to actually make that change. And so uh, great fake as well by Hugh Robertson, you know, and faked out the announcers a little bit and some other people. And uh, just, just a really, really big call that really – uh, change the momentum in that second half. I know you guys have heard me talk about Home Field Apparel a lot, but there's a reason. I have some of these shirts from Home Field Apparel, and they are a premium collegiate apparel brand based in Indianapolis. And what I love about them is they're focused on creating incredibly comfortable, officially licensed apparel with vintage college designs. So go to homefieldapparel.com and check out their Illini gear. The Flying Illini t-shirt I love. If they have any bomber jackets, go check those out. But you see all of these vintage designs that are great. So they kind of stand out in a crowd. But also, these are comfortable, well-fitting. They're not the boxy kind of ones you get at the random department store. No, these are well-fitted, comfortable t-shirts and apparel. So go check it out at homefieldapparel.com. Go to the drag down menu, click on Illini, and you'll see all of these great shirts, including Orange Crush, old school fighting Illini basketball shirts, the flying Illini t-shirt with the great winged logo, script Illini gear, including t-shirts, hoodies, an orange ringer tee, the 2004-05 Illinois basketball shirt so you can relive those glory days, but also, they have great hoodies, great crew necks, great Illini football gear, including the 80s Illini helmet on there. If you're an old school sweatshirt guy, they got those. If you're a quarter zip guy, they got those. If you want a women's tank there with the script Illini, they got that. So go to homefieldapparel.com to check out all the great gear they have there. If you're not an Illini fan, they have more than 180 plus growing list of schools so you can check out all the gear from all over the country and right now use code illini24 for 15 percent off at homefieldapparel.com that's illini24 for 15 percent off all the gear at homefieldapparel.com all right jay i want to give all the flowers to the illinois defense we'll, we'll get into it how is that michigan's quarterback situation how, how is that possible i i have no idea we talked about it and and I'm not sure how this happened. I, I know in listening to your podcast with uh, whoever the Michigan 247 guy mm -hmm. is, is, you know, that there, there were some questions about Jim Harbaugh coming back and, and you know, they were in the playoff. I, I still don't think that's an excuse. I, I still think you had to get ahead of this and say, hey, we're obviously not going to probably not going to have a quarterback. And even if we have J.J. McCarthy back, let's still spend a million bucks to get a, a real serviceable backup. Um the fact that they have a walk-on, Alex Orgy, who's never really thrown the ball great in high school and college, and Jack Tuttle, who out of high school, yeah, was a good quarterback, never made it at Utah, didn't, couldn't play at Indiana, couldn't beat out the people in Indiana, and then comes to Michigan and thinks he's going to play there. It, it just didn't make sense to me that they didn't have someone better or that they haven't recruited someone better at yeah, that point. You know? so yeah. it, just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me how Michigan let that happen uh, have they lost a lot in the offensive line? Yes. Did they lose a lot of defensive players? They sure did. But they, they they shouldn't be like that on offense. All right. We were concerned about the run game, though, right? Uh, I thought they'd play Alex Orgy a little bit. They did not do that. But the, the Illinois defensive front, and I include the linebackers involved there. Aaron Henry, you can talk about the scheme with the bare front and two linebackers. But they contained that Michigan run, rushing attack from having the explosive plays, Jay. And, boy, did they get after Jack Tuttle, uh, which were, to the point where that, that guy was – was afraid to make a throw. It seemed like. I mean, he was just missing open throws too when he was open. I, I would say this: as hard as I've been on the front seven, and some of that has been earned, I, I got to give a lot of praise to the front seven. Um, I thought that uh, Gay Backus, Dylan Rosiak, Matthew Bailey, T. Ra Edwards played their best games of the season. It doesn't mean they play air free. It just means they played their best games of the season. Uh, although he didn't make a ton of plays, Dennis Briggs really stout. Really, really stout. Played through some injury stuff as well in, in the game. 
really stout. Seth Coleman played good, but I don't you feel close to like five sacks more this season. Like he feels so close. He's dude. close. So he's, he's really close. Zeke Holmes had some good reps in there he's as good. well. You know, um, so I just want to give my credit. I, I didn't think that the linebackers in the previous weeks read very well when it came to polls or play play identification or tackle well. I thought Dylan Rosiak, Xavier Scott, uh, James Cruz to degree. Matthew Bailey, they did exceptional as far as tackling. Uh, they didn't have to tackle nearly as much in space as in as in Penn State, but they did a great job. And, and Gay Backus, I mean, I can't I can't say enough about Gay Backus from the force fumble to you know, as Brett Bielema said, smelling smelling blood on his you know matchup that he had. Uh, but he was a wrecking ball to be an outside linebacker and to have 13 tackles and two and a half, three sacks and a forced fumble. He was an absolute wrecking ball. And you felt like if him and Coleman and some of these guys were on defense, there's no way they were going to score. They were so physical at the point of attack, but they had better success on first down. And that sets up passing situations. You can pin your ears back. And when you knew that Michigan had to throw, just like we saw with Illinois had to throw against Penn state to get back in the game, you can see the defensive line is going to eat. Because they know there is no run responsibility. We can go hit somebody. I want to ask you, um, you know, Brett said before the season he took Gabe to Big Ten Media Days because he doesn't know if there's going to be a fourth year. He was having a pretty good year, but it, you're just kind of waiting for that takeover game, sure. Jay. So, like, wh what does this mean for his NFL possibilities, whether that's next year or maybe this year? Well, I, you know, I think the way Gabe's played, I think he can be an NFL player this year. I, I don't know if that necessarily serves him well, because I, I would, you know, I'm certainly not a draft analyst, but I would put him in the kind of the mid to late round draft pick era era right now, where I think that if he spent another year developing and kind of learning the interior position and being able to bounce back and forth and being versatile at the next level, he could be a top three, you know, draft pick, top, top three round draft pick, excuse me. Um, and I think Illinois could really, really use him, um, uh, could, could really, really use him. And he seems like he's a real leader on this football team too. He really does. He seems like he's a guy that, um, a lot of people look up to. And so I, I, I love, I, I think, I think Gabe's best days are ahead of him. He's been able to stay healthy. You know, he had a hand injury a couple of years back and he just looks really, really strong at the point of attack and a grown man out there. Was there anything that stood out about what Aaron Henry did? The players talked about was kind of keep it simple. I, I'm just wondering, Jay, how, how replicable is this against other offenses that they're going to play? I mean, Oregon's one thing, but Minnesota, Michigan State, some of these Rutgers, some of these teams coming up. Well, listen, you get five sacks and three turnovers, um, you're going to do really well. I mean, the thing we got to ask ourselves is how can we continue to have success on first down? Because that sets up passing situations. Remember, we haven't had success on first down. The offenses have been – whatever they want to do on second and third down run or pass, we were able to do that. Number one, number two is where we get pressure on the quarterback. Pressure on the quarterback is the number one determinant of uh, turnovers because quarterbacks turn the ball over the most via fumbles and, and throwing interceptions and whatnot. And we're, we were able to do that. Now I will say uh, they've obviously been coaching up stripping the football. I mean, you just don't tackle like that, right. With a punch. It, it was, uh, it was Gabe had one. Was it Bailey had the other one? Yep. Um, you know, they, they're, they're doing that. Miles Scott got a pick taken away, rightfully so. That was a penalty on, on Caleb Patterson. But but we're getting our hands on balls. And Matthew Bailey, obviously, they went to the well one, one too many times on Colston Loveland. I mean, one once, shame on me. Twice, shame on you. Uh, and then three times, I'm going to pick you off. Because it was three times in a row they went to Colston Loveland and what that. So, so do I think it's – can they do that again? Yes. Do I think Oregon is a totally different scheme and different athletes on the offensive side? Uh, I, I do. But I think it shows a lot of growth to win that Purdue game and to say, that's not our identity. Let's go back to what we do well and let's just go play. And I got to shout out T. Rye Edwards to have a nose with that kind of production in a game um, puts a ton of pressure on a defense. So I got to shout out T. Rye Edwards. Uh, I thought he played great. I thought Dylan Rosiak, uh, again, probably his best game. Uh, of the season as far as reading and making tackles in the box. I want to bring up Matthew Bailey as well, because sometimes because he's been here three years, you know, played a role as a freshman, had three picks, and because he was supposed to play last year, we kind of forget he's a first-time starter. Sure. Right? And, and he's going through these ups and downs, and I talked with him about that, and he said, hey, I'm failing, but I'm excited when I fail because I know I'm going to get better. 
Uh, that's a great mindset um, for a guy, but sure. this is what they need out of him, right? Like this, these are the right. kind of plays they need another playmaker in that, in that position specifically. Well, I think, I think in my opinion, and this plays into Matthew Bailey. So we talk about getting the best 11 on the field. I think the best 11 on the field right now is having that bare front, a five man front with Gabe Ackes, Dennis Briggs, um, uh, Seth Coleman, T. Rod Edwards, maybe getting. We saw Zeke in there a lot. I Zeke Alec was great. <laughs> yeah, Zeke, Zeke, Zeke Holmes, uh, Alec Bryant. So those five, and then it's almost like uh, Rosiak set himself apart as a linebacker. But then you have Rosiak in there with Xavier Scott and Matthew Bailey. That kind of is your quasi linebackers. Then you have Caleb Patterson and you know. Um, Miles Scott. We didn't see. I didn't see a ton of Tory Cox. I didn't see a ton of Terrence Brooks. We only had four DBs on the field most right, of the time. Right. So, so we didn't have a have a ton of you know stuff out there. Uh, I know Xavier Scott moves over to corner, but that, just tell what what is our best eleven? I know we had James Cruz in there sometimes, and whatnot. What gives us the best chance to win? Uh, what I like about Matthew Bailey is he's in a run pass conflict position because you've got a run gap. Okay. And you've also got probably a top two or three tight end in the nation that you're guarding man to man. And yeah, they let him go. Sometimes he was open. Sometimes he made some crazy catches on fourth and 18. He's good. Yeah, right. He's good. Um, we, by the way, everybody's been running what I see. I've, I've seen the Purdue flea flicker uh, that they ran against us to the tight end. You know, everybody's running that. Now. So the lions run that we need to run that to Tanner Ark and Barry Lundy. If you're listening. So there you go. Um, but what I would say is it's a run pass conflict you know, position, meaning, you know, Miles Scott, love the guy. He's never going to be really in run pass conflict, right? It's going to be pass first. And a lot of the DBs as well. So you're going to give up some big plays, but Matthew Bailey just has the physicality that you want and good ball skills. So he does a lot of different things. Talk about a good identification as far as recruitment. I don't know how highly recruited he was out of Moline. You would know that more, but it, it's, it seems like they really identified a guy that they thought could be good and fit that position. And he's really, really come to it, but he's still less than a full year of game experience. Cause he kind of got in sparingly that freshman year and played some in certain sub packages. And last year really played a series or two and that was it. So he's getting that game experience. Jay, I know you want to mention something about depth because we, we saw more depth. We saw Malachi Hood get on the field. We saw Sabor Kareem get on the field uh, on that Gabe Ackes uh, fumble. Um, We've seen Colin Dixon, Hank Beatty. Uh, I thought he had two good catches. One got called back because of a penalty. But those guys, you're starting to see that develop a little bit. So what's important there? Well, I think for me, it's we've we've had good football years at Illinois. And then the class graduates or moves on. And there is a huge void, right? And I think that's that's what's happened. Uh, we, you know, 2007, you thought you had some pieces that were young football players that, you know, but you lost so much. 2022, you lose a lot of senior leadership. And bam, you drop off. So to see that depth coming up, I see Joe Barna getting on the field. I see Colin Dixon making plays. I see, you know, and I'm not even covering some of the starters. Bailey's just a sophomore. Caleb Patterson is a sophomore. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, we have players out there. Alex Bray's a freshman. We, we have some different pieces. And, and everybody on that offensive line, other than J.C. Davis, could, could come back next year, right? And so you yeah, all your running backs are back next year. You know, so you start to get see these. Luke could come back next year. So you start to see these different pieces, and you're like, wow, this is not like just, oh, it's a bunch of seniors on a team, and they're going to be special for a long you know, this year, but next year. No, I think that depth is really key. All right, Jay, get to go to number one Oregon this week. They go let's up go. as Texas loses to Georgia. Yeah, let's go. I mean, all right, the last time Illinois played number one team was, of course, when you guys went to Ohio State, beat them 28 to 21. So take me in. When you're an underdog heading on the road at number one, what does the mindset have to be? Well, I, I think first and foremost is that you have nothing to lose, number one. So you have nothing to lose going out there. Um, yeah, you have team goals and stuff, but you're the, you can be the aggressor. It's not like I got to play tight. Number two is – the number one team is good enough to beat you without your mistakes. So you can't beat yourself, right? right. So, you know, turnovers. Turnovers were a huge part in, in that game against Ohio State. I think we had three turnovers that game, right? And you're going to have to have players that 
um, your, your good players are going to have to play good, but you're also going to have players that maybe you're not thinking of make some plays for you. You know, we saw that against Michigan with T.R.I. Edwards. He wasn't on my bingo board for two sacks, right? You know, when we went to Ohio State, DeRay Hicks, Miami Thomas, they, those guys had interceptions, right? Antonio Steele had interceptions, big plays. Uh, Daniel Dufresne had a big game where Rashard Mendenhall maybe didn't have as big a game as he usually does. Um, Aurelius Ben and Vontae Davis were actually knocked out at halftime of that game. We played the whole second half without Aurelius Ben and Vontae Davis. So what happens, right? Juice Williams played out of his mind. So your good players played really good and defensively, you're going to give up some points. You got to weather the early storm and stay in the game. If you remember, Ohio State scored 14 points in the first six minutes of that ball game. And they went on to score six, seven more points uh, the next 54 minutes. Can you weather the storm and make it a game in the second half where anything can happen? That's a lot easier said than done. Yeah, so this offense is ridiculous. Uh, Dylan Gabriel is a Heisman candidate for a reason. Jordan James, their running backs are really good. They got five-star wide receivers. Good offensive line with several guys that will be pros. Uh, so defensively, Jay, uh, what's the key for Illinois to just – you know, contain Oregon and give their offense yeah. a chance. I, I think the the plan is similar to what it was at Penn State and Michigan, which is, hey, we're, we're going to really limit the big play um, and, and we're going to do this. And can you get better front seven play like you did against Michigan, but you didn't have necessarily against uh, Penn State? Can you take that jump and say, hey, we'll play that same defense, but we're able to stop people in, in the front seven? Uh, that's really going to be the thing and success on first down. So you can kind of get them off schedule and maybe bring some pressure on third down and containing Dylan Gabriel up until this point, other than Ryan Brown, we haven't seen a ton of quarterbacks run on Illinois. You know, Rayola is a decent athlete. Um, uh, Jalen Daniels is a good athlete, uh, but we haven't seen a lot of people just take off and run. Dylan Gabriel can do that if he needs to. And so you got to be, cognizant of that all right offensively um you know more talent uh, for oregon one of the most talented rosters here but uh, i would expect luke altmeyer and this offense are going to throw the ball around a little bit more so what's the key for the offense oh i th i think first and foremost you got to protect luke altmeyer that's really where the wheels came off against penn state he was really running for his life and again that starts with can you run the football so it's not just pass, pass, pass. I'll take Pat Bryant and Zachary Franklin against anybody in the country on catching contested balls and getting the ball. And you know that Barry Lunny is going to have something schemed up to try to get them the ball in space and whatnot. Can we win in the margins? Can Aiden Lawfrey have another 50, 60 yard game? Can Josh McCray have a couple catches, catch a block, cut a couple blocks and do that? Can Tanner Arkin pick up two or three catches? probably in the red zone where Illinois loves to throw the tight end. So it's going to be a team effort, but Luke Altmaier is really the guy that makes this thing. He's got to play well for us to have a chance to win in this game, both with his legs, taking care of the football, and also uh, with his arm. Jay, you're 6-1, and one, number 20 in the country, going to the number one team with – the final five games, you got a chance to be in Big Ten title contention. You got a chance to be in college football playoff contention. What do you make of this? Well, it's pretty astounding, you know, from where they were at last year, what people thought coming into the beginning of the year. You know, I, I'll be honest. I said from four to seven wins. I was as low as four and as and as high as seven. And uh, and we always say that the, the players should should think more than, than I should think because it's their team. I was trying to be objective with it. I think what has really surprised me, I wouldn't say surprise, but Luke Altmaier's taking a big jump, a really big jump. I mean, we have, I think it's 15 touchdowns now. He's got some rushing touchdowns, 15 touchdowns and one interceptions, one interception. That, that's really clean, smart football. You can win doing that. Um, so I think his jump along with Pat Bryant and Zachary Franklin, that's what really kind of kept the, the, was the story of the first half of the season. If they can on the back end here, fix up the front seven and be able to run the ball in the interior better. What we're going to see is we're going to see a very, very tough team to beat down the stretch with those last four games. Are they a little bit outmanned uh, in speed and size in this game? I would say, yes, it's the difference between a top five team and a top 20 team. You're going to have some differences there. Do I think they're going to be embarrassed? Uh, no, I, I don't think I, I, we haven't seen that under Brett Bielema. I think they're going to have opportunities that they get to take advantage of. You can't get the ball in the two like Penn State and not get any points. 
Before I let you go, I got to ask you about Indiana. Um, seven and zero, oh, and if if you were skeptical of, hey, these guys haven't played anybody. I get it; their schedule is favorable. They are crushing teams, including Nebraska. They they just fifty six to seven, I believe it was. Um, four and zero. Oh, their point differential in conference play so far one eighty one to seventy two. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, have some bigger tests coming up, but eleven wins looks very possible for for this team, and I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want them on my schedule, right? Yeah, now. usually I got to go and see them in week two against Western Illinois. Really hard to see what they were like against Western. Um, but one thing I got was that Kurt Signetti was very confident. I mean, we, we've seen the quote now, I win, Google me. But the guy wasn't lying. And, you know, did have, uh, I forget the number, somewhere between eight to ten people transfer from James Madison that ended up playing significant times. And James Madison is, is kind of brought that championship program mindset. They were a good uh, FCS team. And then they got into the Sun Belt and, and other teams and they, they're actually good this year. Um, so he, he, he had that transfer kind of uh, caught lightning in a bottle with Curtis Rourke, who's been really good. Unfortunately, sounds like he might be out. And Taven Jackson, who's a good backup, uh, who played well against Nebraska, is going to be playing. But what an incredible job and excited for, I'm excited for a team like Indiana. I think just it's so good for the league for Indiana and Illinois to be good. I think, I think it makes everything exciting. And what's so interesting is we're, we're seeing in this age of NIL, actually, we, we thought it could separate people. We're seeing more parity. We're seeing stuff happen that we're seeing. Hey, anybody can beat anybody on any given day to a degree that hasn't always been the case in college football the last 20 years. Yeah. Uh, and I was shocked. Iowa lost uh, UCLA uh, able to, to win this weekend. Uh, over Rucker. So I agree with you. A- after the top three, it just feels like anybody can beat anybody. Well, it's, it's so interesting to me. And it, it, it comes down so much to coaching. You know, Kurt Signetti, not really high on maybe many coaching, you know, searches, but he had won everywhere he went and had three different head jobs. You know, you look at some of the coaches that are struggling right now in the Big Ten. Uh, of course, Deshaun Foster just got a win with UCLA, but he had been struggling first time head coach. Ryan Walter struggling, Sharon Moore uh, struggling. These are guys that went from assistant to head coach, which I'm not saying you can't be successful. Ryan Day has done that. Urban Meyer has done that. But I think to be successful, maybe at a lower tier team uh, in the Big Ten, when it's traditionally been a lower tier team, you really need that experience. We see Illinois benefiting that from Brett Bielema. We see Michigan State benefiting from that from Jonathan Smith, who, you know, was at Oregon State and did that. So I think coaching is a huge thing and experience in coaching and what that brings to the table. We see Mike Loxley, a lot of trouble at New Mexico. And now, you know, had some trouble. Maryland's been up and down. They come and beat USC in a huge win, right? So oh, and, and he's a better coach because he's coached longer. So it does come down to coaching in these games, right, um, that are really against evenly matched teams. Jay Lehman, you're the goods. Uh, thanks for making us football smarter as always. We will catch up next week after Illinois plays at number one, Oregon. Let's go.